All right, so as I mentioned uh, just before maybe some of you arrived, homework five is currently available in the materials directory, as is today's lecture uh, notebook. Um, one caution about this one. So there's a couple a couple of weird things about this lecture. Uh, first of all, the lecture notebook, <clears throat> some of the lines are really slow. Uh, so just, you know, if they're taking a while to come back, that's why. Um, as a result, there's not a whole lot of like, your own kind of typing um, because I just kind of wanted, I want to display it as well um, without it being too much of a pain to keep up with. But I want to try to remember not to run those, if you know what I mean. Um, apparently we're not going to video at all today because nothing technology is working. Um, let's see if that works. Uh, so that was the first thing. Um, checkpoint one due today, end of the day. Um, obviously, there's no requirement to stay up till midnight to submit it, um, but uh, it is due today, uh, which you probably mostly know. Uh, checkpoint two is next Tuesday. Keep in mind, next Tuesday, we will have lecture. Um, it will probably be, I mean, I know it'll be like kind of like a case study. So we'll talk about some kind of data science in the real world. Um, rather than kind of a topic that is really required to kind of get you to the final. So if you aren't gonna be able to be here, uh, it should be interesting, um, but it's not completely critical. Um, I also will probably make the Zoom link available to anybody um, if you wanna watch it, uh, you know, because you're, you know, in a car or something like that, trying to go home. Um, however, Checkpoint Due is due that day. So don't forget about it in your excitement for, uh, doing a lot of sleeping with turkey. Um, so that was one thing. However, I do want to point out that both homework five and, uh, sorry, homework five and project two are, um, they're not due till after Thanksgiving. Okay. So even though I'm releasing homework five today, you actually have like two weeks ish to get it done uh, so that they can be in parallel with the project and it shouldn't be too much of a burden. Plus, I don't like you having to work over Thanksgiving. Um, you know, usually I try to actually make it so that the stuff is uh, submitted before Thanksgiving and the new thing isn't assigned till after, but the timing didn't quite work out this year. So, um, or this semester. So, you know, apologies that you have something kind of hanging over your head over Thanksgiving, but you should have enough time that you should only be able to only have to work on it during uh, kind of proper school time. Um, the other thing is that, uh, well, yeah, so we're doing the midterm redo for anybody who wants to participate, please sign up in the link that is on Piazza. If you haven't already, uh, I'm only gonna have probably enough room for the people who sign up. Uh, so make sure you get it done as quickly as possible. Um, I think that's about it. We may have some weirdness about the very last class for this class um, because they also decided to do the dedication for the new building in the middle of this class. So, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, all right, any questions? Right, let me grab this thing and pull it over here. Um, so for some reason, video is completely failing today. I don't know what's going on. Um, and let's get started. Okay, so word, I, oh boy, word I can't say yet again today. I tried it. I was practicing it off and on all day. Still can't say it today. So I know somebody in here can say it. So, Sheva Shev, there you go. It's kind of one of those, it's like when you hear it, you can say it again. But, you know, like sometimes you just get stuck on a word and can't do it. Uh, so Sheva uh, inequality uh, is super fancy because it gives us a lot of useful information about a distribution um, by just kind of knowing a little bit about the uh, standard deviation. So basically, you know how far away from the center um, most of, or you can say kind of a percentage of the results are based on the standard deviations. So you've probably all heard of standard deviations, but now you're maybe you're starting to see why they're useful is because it shows how far away things are. Uh, one thing I want to point out, which... It's not on this slide, it's on a later slide, um, but is this kind of very last part of this sentence, 
which I think is a tempting trap to fall into, is at least this, okay? So in other words, you could have 100% of your results in one standard deviation away from the center, right? But because what it's guaranteeing is that there will be at least this many, okay? So 75% will be within two standard deviations, okay? But like I said, there could be 100% in one standard deviation, or well, two, right? It's one on each side. Um, and, and so that's just a trap you can fall into. Uh, I know I've done questions about that before. So just keep in mind, right, that that's the minimum, not the maximum. Um, usually that's a good thing, right? Uh, but it can be a little deceptive. Uh, so um, these would be good things to memorize um, is basically that with, if you're within two standard deviations, uh, that it's 75%, three, 88, well, 89%, four, 93%, and five is 96%. And so, you know, if, you know, if you've been paying, paying attention, right, you might be starting to see a bit of a theme here, right, is that, you know, we expect this certain amount of error when we're doing this stuff, and it's going to be in the 5 percentage range, okay? So part of that, you know, we see this example here. That's why I only run out to five standard deviations. We could calculate it for any number, right? But when we get to 96%, we're kind of like saying, eh, we're probably within, uh, you know, uh, you know, kind of our, our potential for error, okay? And we're not gonna worry too much about the parts that are on the outside of that. All right, make sense? So now we have a little demo for that. Assuming I can find the right window. And I thought this was all set up, but it is not. Uh, the other thing I'll say is that I don't, I don't really like the way this lecture is laid out. I feel like it, it kind of jumps back and forth a little too much. So apologies in advance for any confusion. I'm also basically not going to run nearly anything in this because of the ones that are super slow. And, uh, you know, me doing tap dancing is, is more challenging. Um, so, but the first thing we're going to do is let's say we have our baby table, right? So, uh, you know, good gracious. See, I, I broke my own rule and already had a problem. Um, so we're gonna load in our baby table. You know, we've looked at it before, um, but we're gonna look at it a little differently in that we're actually gonna drop this maternal smoker data because let's say we wanna know where maybe there's relationships to that maternal smoker, but we're gonna focus kind of on the rest of the data that's in this table. So uh, just by way of background, um, you know, the weight of the baby, how long the woman was pregnant before she gave birth, how old the woman was, how tall the woman was, um, uh, their weight, uh, I think it was at the time of birth, um, and then obviously the maternal smoker, which we've talked about before. But one of the things I wanted to point out here is that this histogram mechanism with overlay equals false can be super useful if what you wanna see is kind of a histogram of like all of the data that's there uh, so that you can kind of see each one independently. Um, and so what we do to do that is we just have this named parameter. And one of the things that came up in office hours yesterday, maybe, okay, is that I want to point out this kind of model. Actually, let me just do this, um, which is, so all of you should hopefully have a favorite to this, um, you know, but uh, I still search for it. I do too much other Python. Um, but if we look at, come on. All right, well, that's gonna be annoying. Uh, I want the real documentation. Um, so, so what I just kind of want to point out here quickly, right, is we have this method, right, has a number of, this isn't even the right documentation that I want. Um, there's the more kind of raw documentation. Oh, there should be. All right, we'll just use this one. Um, oh, this. Okay, so the thing I want to point out here is that 
many of the things we use, right, do take parameters, okay? And they take who knows how many, right, of the methods that we use. So for example, histogram takes at least two parameters, okay? But it probably actually takes more than that. So there's, the nice thing about Python is that you can have defaults for a parameter, okay? And so when we just call it with two parens like that, we're just saying, take all the defaults for the parameters, do, do whatever you think is best, essentially, okay? However, we can name a parameter as well, okay? We can say, I'm gonna say, I want all defaults for all the parameters except this one, okay? And so it's really important to remember that that's what we're doing here, okay? Is that we're saying, okay, we're gonna pass in one parameter and now it's, an, it's what's called a positional parameter or an ordered parameter, but the term is positional. So we're relying on the fact that the first position, so the zeroth parameter, is column, okay? And then we're, we don't know where bins is. It's one of the parameters, okay? But it's probably not the second one, okay? So we're just gonna name it and call it bins and say, whichever parameter it is, that's the one I want to be setting, okay? There's two weird things about this. You could get lucky and not do bins equals, and it could just be the second parameter. So just be careful when you're using a, you know, another parameter that it's where you think it is, okay? So the kind of the, the normal way of any kind of programming is normally by positional. So you should have a good idea of where in the set of parameters, the particular one you're passing is. But in Python, if you, you know, like I said, if you want to take defaults until it, then you can use bins, okay? Or name the parameter. The other thing I want to point out is that you can't use positional parameters, and this kind of makes sense if you think about it, you can't use positional parameters after you've named a parameter, okay? So think about it for a second. Let's just say there's, you know, 10 parameters on this method, okay? And the sixth one is bins. So is the next one after that eighth position, right? Or second position? So because that's unclear, they just disallow it. So if you're using positional, you can do it before you do any name parameters. But the second you get any name parameters, you have they have to stay named if you want to set any more. Does this make sense? All right. So the reason I point this out is because there's definitely been some confusion about this. Um, especially the get lucky part, right? Which is where, you know, the second parameter happens to also be the one that you name, but we've always done it with a name parameter, for example, in class. So just be aware of it. The documentation is your friend. I actually prefer the like raw, like the more raw documentation than this, which I can't find right this minute, um, which is just literally list the parameters, what all the parameters do, the order they go in, the names of them, um, because I can usually extrapolate from that what I want out of it, okay? However, you know, this is meant to be a teaching module, so there's a lot of color, right? It tells you a lot more about it in, like, this kind of documentation. So this is where you want to go if you're not quite sure what a histogram does, right, versus you want to know the specifics about how to call that particular weird method, and you want to know what the parameters are, what other things you could set. And the reason I bring it up, obviously, is that's not going to help. Is that here's a new named parameter. Okay. So we're relying on all defaults for column, right? And bins. But in this case, we're going to name a different parameter that we haven't named before. And we're going to say overlay equals false. Um, just kind of a, you know, language notation note. Um, Generally speaking, the, the common practice is not to have spaces between the parameter name and the value, but, you know, around the equals. It works either way, but generally speaking, it's kind of like a visual indicator that, hey, I'm naming a parameter here rather than doing like an assignment, okay? Um, but, you know, like I said, either one works. It's just, that's the general convention. So overlay equals false, another little parameter you can mess with, which can give you a very easy overview of the data set you're looking at. All right, back to our regular scheduled programming. Um, and so what we wanna do is we're kind of exploring, let's look at this maternal pregnancy weight. And so can we say, you know, the, the weight of the mother, you know, is there anything interesting in there? 
And the first thing I want to point out here is that, um, well, we grab the column, right? But then I can take the average, but then I can actually get the standard deviation using this cool little function called STD, um, which is obviously short for standard deviation. And using uh, Chebyshev's uh, uh, inequality is where we can start to, like this is where an example of that part kind of starts to happen, which is that we can actually figure out where those, um, uh, where those results will be is that our expectation is that whatever percentage, 89%, I think, right? Um, it will be within thir uh, three standard deviations. God, I wish I could talk. And so when we look at it, we actually do get 98% within that. But like I was saying before, it's an at least not a you know guaranteed number. So we can calculate what it should be, okay? And we see that it's you know 88% or 89%. Um, and we can compare the fact that, hey, look, it is above that. So, so this little example, which is obviously not representative of nearly anything except as an example, um, is does follow this rule. Okay. So sorry. So what I wanted to kind of show is that we can write a relatively complicated for loop here. Okay. And so what we're going to do is we're going to grab all of the kind of data by column. And then we're going to kind of look at it against the same inequalities. And so we can see that, hey, look, the birth weight is, you know, with two standard deviations, 95% of the data is in two standard deviations. And Chebyshev says 75%. And just kind of by way of an example, you know, this is a real world set of data. And look, it does conform to this model. The other thing is that, um, so who, you know, we'll talk about this in a minute some more, but, you know, we talked about a little bit the bell-shaped curve. This doesn't need that, okay? This will just work all the time, which is kind of nice. So I think the temptation is often that, you know, you usually see a bell-shaped curve, um, but, you know, not all rules have to use that. All right. So back to the slides. and my slide controller. Hey, look, a question. We haven't had one in a while, so I thought it'd be fun. All right, so, anyway, memorize it. The range of five standard deviations above and below the average encompasses what proportion of the distribution? All right, get your answers in. Remember, participation is the key here, not necessarily correctness. All right, last chance. All right, almost all of you got it right. I thought that was pretty good. So 96%, uh, remember I called it out, right? Is that it's slightly less than the total. Yeah. <laughs> We have a what? Yeah. Did you pass the? It's making its way around. Oh uh, no, paper. Uh, any other questions relevant to ninety six? All right. So, all right. Standard units. Okay. So this is not to be confused with standard deviation. Standard units. So. For example, if we had a midterm and we had a final, they may have a different set of points, okay? And we'll have different distributions of students on how they did on the midterm and the final. And I can say this is representative of nothing. It is purely manufactured and I slapped the label on it. I have no idea what those, uh, you know, if this was ever an actual class or anything. So, um, 
problem with these, right, is that we can't really compare them very well because they're in different units. I mean, they're not really in different units per se, right? They're both about test scores, but the one, the scale of the final had more questions clearly or more points total than there was in the midterm. So what we wanna do if we wanna compare them is we need to kind of shift them into the same space, right? And so what we use for that is what's called standard units, okay? And so the way we do standard units is we like, we do an operation so that we can kind of move both of the distributions so that they're in the same space and are now comparable, okay? And so if you look at this, right, it looks like maybe on the final, students actually did somewhat better than they did on the midterm, which we could maybe kind of see here, but it's definitely harder, right? Because you don't know necessarily like how big a slot is this, right? compared to the you know 70 to 71 over here in kind of in terms of like impact, right? So that's why we use the standard units. Um, and I'll show you an example in a few minutes and like how to do it and stuff. But the point is, is that this is, this is the point. This is why you use them. Um, and they become, I think, largely for like a lot of the rest of the semester and certainly in doing any more data science, they become significantly important because you're, you want to compare apples to apples, right? And so this is a way of shifting the, the sets into the same kind of space so that you can compare them to each other. All right. So also with the standard units, um, we can then, and this is, this is actually one of the transitions where I'm like, eh, I don't really like how this works, but I haven't figured out a better way to do it. Um, but so if we have a lot of the standard deviations are will be basically it'll it'll push the standard deviations will be above average um and what it kind of means is that if we look at this z value and we say value minus the average divided by the standard deviation this is how we can move things into standard units okay so the chicken and egg here is like I want to talk about standard units before I talk about standard deviation, but at the same time, I have to talk about standard deviation before I talk about standard units. So being a circular explanation makes it more complicated to understand. So the way we do the standard units is by leveraging the standard deviation so that we can set them. Let me just read what I wrote here. Um, and so when the values are in standard units, the average will be zero, right? Because we're kind of, like I said, shifting them into the same space and you can kind of see it in this graphic, right? The average will be zero and then the rest of it will be kind of a, appropriately positioned around it. And Chebyshev still works, okay? But it gets somewhat easier in that it will definitely be between, 96% of them will be between minus five and positive five, okay? That makes sense? All right, so yeah, example. So kind of digging into uh, standard deviation a little bit more, um, which personally I think is the more confusing component. Um, and so, well, we're gonna fail on that part. Where did values get defined? Oh, awesome. It's not there. There is. On, really? All right. Let me, uh... It's of course got like twelve hundred records, so I can't like just type it in or something. <laughs> Oh, come on. <laughs> 
Oh, this is annoying. Well, hmm. all right, this is gonna take me a minute to find it. Maybe I will in a minute, but uh, I think there's more uh, uh, questions later. But imagine a table that has a bunch of values. Um, oh, although I already broke the table, but hopefully this will still work. So what we can do though, is we can take that table, which imagine it had, uh, if I hadn't run it, it would have been fine. Call it just shy of 1200 values. Okay, in just a single column called values. And then, we can take the average of that, right? And we get 128, okay? And so with that average, then we can actually do our values minus the average value. This is our deviations, okay? So if we go back to the slide for half a second, then we talk about the deviations here, right? So this chunk of it is the deviations. Why didn't you switch windows? And we're basically going to add a new column called deviations. And so this is basically the difference of the value from the average. Okay. So it's just like, how far away is it? Right. Then we are going to square it. And why do we square it? Anybody have any ideas? Trick we keep using. Sorry, somebody have it over here. Yeah. Yeah, so basically you make it, you know, like I said, difference, not direction, right? So that we can kind of simplify our data. So we're just going to kind of square them all. We're going to get that squared deviation. And then we also, as a result, um, can get the variance, right? Um, and that would be 429, which is the average of those squared deviations, okay? And then finally, we can get to our standard deviation size, which of course, is the square root of the variance. Um, and so we're going to take, uh, sorry, so with the variance, right, we take the average, then we take the square root of that, and that's actually where we get our standard deviation. So we can calculate that all through so we know kind of how it works. But then here we actually have a built-in function which will just calculate it directly. So all it does is takes the average of all the values, right, then squares the, or then does the subtraction, then it does the squaring, and then it uh, takes the square root of the average of the result or the deviations. So that's all this is doing. But that standard deviation, this is one of those things that we were talking about with uh, Chebyshev. Okay. And if you recall, it looks suspiciously also like the, the root mean square. Okay. Which we'll talk about the more about that with the root, root mean square error later like in the future. All right, so now that kind of lets us work with standard units, right? And so the first thing we do, and I think I can run the code again, um, is uh, we define uh, a function that's gonna just create the standard units for us, okay? And so if you notice, right, it kind of uses that same trick where we said, or uh, like the trick that we used before, which is the, um, uh, the value minus the average, right? And then divided by the standard deviation. And so then we end up with, or sorry, this is just our column of maternal ages, but let's get those in standard units, okay? And so now we have the standard units. We can look at it and we see that the, you know, the average of the standard units is negative seven, um, but then the standard deviation is a one. And which is all, again, just trying to get a sense of your data. But now we have our table with the ages, but also the ages in standard units, okay? So the 27 is, you know, the same as 0 0.03, um, you know, the 23 is 0.7, okay? So we've kind of scaled it a bit, um, which might be kind of annoying, especially if you're looking at it kind of raw. But the point is that now these are in standard units, okay? And so now what we can do, which I hope is what we do next, we can, well, wait, this is the age and the average again, but the, now we can do our, let me, oops, wrong way. 
So now this is our original uh, uh, kind of data set in the histogram, but we can also now look at it in standard units, okay? So what does that mean you think we could do now? Now that we have the age in standard units, what could we also do? Because we standardized it. And the standard is across the board, right? So like you now compare any other apple to this orange. Any ideas? What we'd want to do next? Come on, somebody has to have an idea. Oh, sorry. Right, so now we can look at any of the other columns and we can kind of overlay them next to each other and we could actually get a sense of the distribution in comparison to each other, okay? Who knows if that's useful or not, but you know, it certainly is sometimes. Uh, in this case, there's probably some usefulness, um, you know, because maybe it'll help us see a correlation or, you know, or see basically some more opportunities for research, for lack of a better term. All right, so it instructs me to go back to the slides now, so we will. All right. And so this is where we start to get into those bell-shaped curves, okay? Which is that with the standard deviation, like when we were looking at um, this initial age setup, okay? we don't really know what the standard deviation is kind of based on just looking at this, right? Because it's not, it's not like uniform enough to be able to say the standard deviation is, you know, this big or that big or whatever, right? We just kind of like, it's just data, right? So, however, when we talk about a, uh, if we do happen to have a bell shape, oops, oh, I switched windows. Um, if we do happen to have a bell-shaped curve, then we can guess what the standard deviation will be. All right. So, and this is, you know, starts to be important because one of the things that tends to happen with data in the real world is these bell shapes on the distribution are very, very common. Okay. So it's a very handy technique, even though, you know, you could calculate it. You could figure all of that out, but because we have so many things that just end up this way, that we often have uh, this advantage. And so, if we look at it, um, you know, if we if we draw our curve, and this is where my lack of artistic ability becomes kind of a problem because the curve has to look right, otherwise, it's going to not work well. Um, so, what I usually do is I kind of have a curve and I I kind of lay it over it, but so you know that the center line here is where the average will be. Um, and then the standard deviation is the distance between the average and the points of inflection on either side. And so the point of inflection, I tried to draw it in here. Again, my drawing skills are not the absolute best, but the point of inflection is where this curve kind of turns into this curve. Okay, so it's the point at which it's kind of starting to break the other way. Does that make sense? So that's the size of our standard deviation. All right. And, you know, after you look at it for a bit, right, you, you can pretty quickly start to eyeball it, basically. All right. So uh, this is just the same picture, bigger, so you can see it better. I didn't realize it was uh, on the next page. Otherwise, I would have shown it first. Um, but yeah, if you can see, it's kind of like this inflection point here. Okay. And like I said, the best way I can describe it is like it's when one curve starts turning into the other curve. All right. So, well, that's fun. Okay. And so then, you know, we can kind of do the math as it were. Um, but. Let me see what I was trying to show here. Um, and oh, and so this kind of just proves the point, right? Which is that the standard deviation, right? We can just go call the standard deviation function, but we can actually kind of calculate the pieces and we get an understanding of what's in that space. You know, so 
this is kind of the, the, the numeric version of my drawing, right? Uh, and so it's just, like I said, it's handy. It becomes useful because you tend to see them a lot. Um, and if you kind of think about how the math works, that's also handy because then you can actually figure out where, how is this distribution working? Um, that's not the right thing. All right, so the normal distribution, um, you know, colloquial, colloquially um, is referred to as a bell curve, but it's technically called the, the normal distribution or the normal, uh, normal, oops, wrong way, normal distribution or the normal curve. Um, and it's because it's what it sounds like, it's uniform and, you know, and therefore kind of by extension, it means it's normal. Um, and so they always look like this. Uh, and if you notice, they're generally thought of in terms of standard units, okay? So in other words, the zero is at the center, um, but that's more of a typically, right? It's not invalid to do it the way I was showing you before. It's just that this is typically what you'll see. Um, and the reason using the typical is handy because now you actually know precisely off the top of your head where one standard deviation is because, hey, it's right there. Right. And you know where two is because, hey, it's right there. Right. OK. So normal proportions. So. Yeah, so this is kind of like going back to uh, the way I think I taught this lecture before is I talked about Chebyshev's uh, inequalities in one lecture and then kind of talked about this part in the other one. So this is kind of just a reminder to the thing we talked about a little bit ago, which is that when we have the distribution that look like this bell shape or this normal curve, um, it's going to be most of the data is an average plus or minus a few standard deviations. Um, and, you know, by extension, almost all the data is within plus or minus three. Okay. Um, so this is a, a little bit of weirdness, right? Is that when you talk about one standard deviation, you mean on both sides, right? So um, so it's 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 not like two is is four, right? One is two and two is four and three is six, right? So uh, and and the terms are slightly used somewhat interchangeably. So just kind of keep that in mind because a lot of times we'll cut things off at zero, right? And so one distribution will still be on the right, et cetera. So just kind of keep that in mind is that if we say three, we kind of sort of mean six. That makes sense? All right. Um, so because it gets even better with those inequalities uh, when we talk about the normal distribution, basically, it's not just the 89% that uh, Chebyshev predicts, it's all the way up to 99% within three standard deviations, okay? So that's super handy. Mm -hmm. All right, oh, and then the other one I point out too is that 95% on, on two standard deviations, that looks suspiciously like our p-value cutoffs, right? So, hey, maybe there's a relationship between why we choose a p-value cutoff of 5% and this, right? Does that make sense? All right. So if we think about uh, the graph of that same thing. Um, so in other words, if we go back to that p-value example, if our p-value is in here, right, which hypothesis is true? The null or the alternative? Anybody? Mm -mm. The alternative. Um, because basically what we're saying by our 95% being in this area is that this is questionable. It's, it's error area, right? So there's a possibility there's an error. So we assume that everything from here left is actually part of the alternative. And same with the blue on the right, uh, your right. Um, so when it falls in that, what we're saying is that 
Oh, well, technically speaking, it is part of the null region, but because of error and our suspicion of error, we basically give 5% and we're saying, nope, if it falls in this part out here, then it's actually part of the alternative <laughs> because our, our random testing, we suspect has a certain amount of error. All right, let's see. Um, okay, so moving on to central limit theorem, um, which I can't remember. If, no, I think I decided not to put this in the homework. So, um, but it might be in the project towards the end. I can't remember. Um, but central limit theorem describes how the normal distribution of bell-shaped curve is connected to random sample averages. Um, and so why do we care about them? Because they estimate population averages. So let's talk about it a little bit more and then we'll show a picture. So if the sample is large, okay, um, and as we've talked about before, small and large are relative depending on kind of the context you're in, um, and drawn at random with replacement, then regardless of the distribution of the population, the probability distribution of the sample average or sum is roughly the normal distribution. Okay, so, so this is a theory. So um, that means it's like a proven thing, okay? Um, or mostly proven thing. Um, and so what this tells us is that we can get an idea of where that distribution is gonna look, uh, is gonna land. So let me show a demo because I think it's easier. I think this one. All right, so if we go back to our um, uh, plane flight delays, right? And we have 13,000 some odd rows. Um, and so if we, great. Um, so if we take a population of size seven and a sample size of two, okay? then what, what can we kind of figure out, right? So in this case, we have, Christ. Sorry, this is throwing me off too. Um, so let me kind of work through it and kind of try to explain it a little bit later. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, okay, um, we want to say our sample size is 100 and our population is 13,825. Um, and then we're going to take another one and say, okay, how big is this if we have 400 for our sample size? Those are some really big numbers. Okay. So we have a histogram that we saw before. Um, let me skip that. And we'll talk about our sample mean. So this is when we're starting to do our sampling. And Remember, no parameters means we're going to do with replacement. And so one of our sample means is going to be 17.98. So what we can do here, right, is we can not execute this amount of testing by using this rule, okay? Because what we don't want to do is actually run anything for 400 samples, right? Because we have 13,000. Right. So we, you know, like if we wanted to grab the whole population, right, and run 400 samples on that whole population, this is what we're looking at for the size of our result. Okay. So that's going to be really, really hard on the computer. So, and I think I will show that to you in a minute. Um, so if we take our sample size and, oh, sorry, that was just a method. And we take our sample size and we call this one sample mean, right? So in other words, we're going to take a sample of the whole United flight, but only of the sample size. We are only going to take 100, okay? And we have to do that 10,000 times to make it reasonable, okay? Is this going to be a useful result, right? Because is this big enough for... So this is part of why I don't like how this is explained, but um, is this big enough to actually get a reasonable approximation 
of that delay period that we're looking for. And so, as you might imagine, right, a sample size of 100 of 13,000 does not seem like a very big percentage, right? So it's likely going to be too small. And so if we look at our initial, this is the actual observed histogram, right? And if we look at this one, we're not seeing kind of the same distribution, right? It's it's basically it's not getting distributed. Oh, God, I don't I really don't like how this slide, this example works. Um, so what we can do is we take those averages here. Or, uh, yeah, I thought I had a an actual observed average too, but so the actual observed average is sixteen, right? And our standard deviation is thirty nine. In here, our average observed or our average is. I don't know, maybe it's 16. So maybe it's all right. But as you can see, our distribution is pretty wide. So what we want though, is we want to be closer to that 16 for a lot more of them, right? So if you notice, like make sure you look at the numbers at the bottom, this is a much wider data set than this one. So we're, it's kind of getting taller, right? Um, but it's not too easy to see here. I'll show you a different graph in a second. And as we get closer, as we get to 900, and this is the part I was saying, it takes a really long time to run. It would be helpful probably for you to kind of run it and you'll see what happens. But as you can see, this one's continuing to get taller and narrower, right? So we're getting closer to the actual average when we take a bigger sample size of 900. And so here they are all laid together. So I think it's a lot easier to read. Um, the first one that 100 is very spread out. And then we have this 400, which is the orangey. And then the blue one here, or the light blue one that is this tall one. And so what we can see is, hey, our, our size, right? Our sample size is probably not big enough when we choose the 100. We need to choose something that's more like 900. And when we have the data set and we have the means to run it, we can, and it can be really useful. So going back over here, and So in other words, if it starts to look like a normal distribution, then it's probably the right size-ish, okay? So if you go back to, oops, here. Yeah, so maybe I need a better example. Maybe that's the problem because um, it's not as obvious. But so this probability distribution of the sample average or sum is roughly the normal distribution. So in other words, we know what it should look like and we can make a guess about what it should look like based on knowing what the average is, okay? So we can try to have a distribution if we know it's gonna be centered around this number here, right? It was 16 and, or like nearly 17. It's gonna be centered around here. So we can start to make some guesses about what this distribution is gonna look like without necessarily needing to calculate it because of those standard deviation rules, because of the, num uh, the normal distribution rules, we can start to have some idea of what this should look like before we actually do the math, uh, do the work. Does that make sense? Okay, so it can be kind of used either direction. It can kind of tell you, Am I, is 900 giving me the right kind of answer? Okay, like is it is it correct-ish, okay, uh, for our sample size? But it can also be kind of done in the inverse, is that can we actually just calculate what the distribution looks like without actually running a sample at all? Right? And that would be super handy when we have to do very big calculations that maybe we can just calculate what it should look like instead of actually creating the thing that is what it looks like, right? So this is kind of how we start to try to get a little more sophisticated in how we do it. Um, and just kind of, this is a little bit just by way of comparison, you know, as the, as the sample size goes up, right? It starts to look, you know, it doesn't look the same. Maybe I should, like I said, change the graphics, but the distribution is going to start to look like a normal distribution around what we want it to be or what we expect the average to be. Because in this case, we happen to know 
what the answer is because it's not actually that big a population. All right, so, so, and this is kind of the crux, right? Which is imagine all possible random samples the same size as yours, and there are lots of them, right? Each of these samples has an average. The distribution of those sample averages is the distribution of the averages of all the possible samples. So that's super handy, which I think is what our next example is. Oops. So, just trying to make sure this isn't going to take forever to run. Yeah, so in other words, we can see the values here by calculating them, right? And yet we can also actually sample for it. And we can see that this 100 isn't great because our uh, standard deviation is too high, right? Because the, sorry, I'm trying to look for, I really, I, I really got to rework this. I don't know. I don't like how this explains it. Um, so, yeah, basically. So, if our standard deviation is this big, that means that our data is like distributed too far. If it's a normal distribution, we shouldn't have this big a standard deviation. It should be close to one, right? Because the standard deviation is one. So, as we get higher, you see it starts to get closer. And then, hey, 625, you know, we're getting closer yet. Um, and ultimately, uh, it's the same thing. Um, just trying to think of the best way to show this. Um, yeah, and so basically, as we kind of get closer and closer, we'll start to see this standard deviation getting closer to what we expect it to be, okay? And so that's kind of how we start to figure out, and I'll cover this again in like another lecture and we'll try to, I'll try to figure out another way to kind of explain it to help uh, if you're not following it entirely. But this, as we get closer, that means that we're, we're doing a better and better job, right? So, however, what gets very cool is, So, so these are some of the questions that happen here, right? Let me just make sure what's on the next slide. So we can figure out what the center of the distribution is. Um, and it's roughly a bell curve centered at the population average, which is kind of what we talked about already. Um, but then, but then the variability of that sample average helps us measure how accurate the sample average is as an estimate of the population average. So in other words, this is like getting us closer and closer to a way, hey, maybe we can just calculate the answers to the questions we want. Um, and I think I'm gonna skip the questions here. Ah. We'll come back to these next time. Ah, all right. I don't have a slide in here of, of the kind of the crux of it. I thought I had it still in here. I don't think yeah um so but long story short is we'll do it next time i thought i didn't think we'd get to it um but basically you can calculate now what the right answer is from just your average and the standard deviation size and you can just figure out how far or you know kind of where that sample looks like or you know various pieces of it that you want to be able to test or not have to test because you can just calculate where all of your results will be because of the properties of the normal distribution and the, you know, and by extension, Chebyshev's inequality, you can just figure out, hey, this is where all of the results will be without actually having to figure out where all the results will be. Does that make sense? Um, but sadly, I do not have that slide here today. It's in the, like in the next lecture. Um, so we'll talk about that more next time. Um, and like I said, I apologize. I don't like how this one's laid out very well. 
um, but I'll, I'm still working on trying to figure out a better way to talk about it. So if anybody has ideas, feel free to let me know. Um, any questions? So it was mostly we were doing a long walk to show you how we actually get to this cool function that we can just calculate some of this stuff without actually having to do the work. <laughs>